Well, you know, we have had uh, such a blessed time. I know Daryl and I really appreciated the worship and the ministry through the conference. It's just been, been awesome, been really refreshing for us, actually. And um, Pastor Peter and Anika, what great people you guys are, great friends, and we so appreciate you. And, you know, like we've been privileged to travel a lot. And uh, a lot of different nations and churches of all shapes and sizes, denominations, socioeconomic settings, you name it. Um, and one of the things I just really appreciate about your senior pastors and your leadership team, actually, is not just their integrity, but their, uh, their, they are real people. That what you see is what you get. It's a safe house. And I've got to say to you, not every church is a safe house. I know that sounds pretty ugly, but it is the reality. At the end of the day, church leaders are just people on a journey like every one of us. And um, sometimes insecurity and, you know, those kind of things can, can be an issue in leadership in churches, just like it can be an issue everywhere. But these people are secure, and they're stable, and they're strong, and they're focused. And the, the, the leadership team, your eldership, are just fantastic people. They really are. They're just very real people. And so I, we, Daryl and I certainly would want to honor you guys and honor the team and uh, everything that's going on in the river. And we've been connected, I think, for about six years, must be getting on towards six years, and it's just been a real blessing to us, and so we appreciate your partnership with us and the privilege of being able to come in and out of the house and uh, interact with people, and and uh, we're almost at the point where we call each other friends, aren't we? We're just about there, just about, just about there. We've still got a little bit of hesitation and, you know, just a, a few, few little boxes to tick, but we're getting there. <laughs> it's great um, I, you know the kingdom of God everything about God and everything about the kingdom is about increase you know if you look at creation everything is is increase I sometimes think about the power of a seed the, the amazing potential in just one apple seed for increase. You, know, you take an apple seed and you put it in the ground and it grows, you get a tree. And then every year you get this crop of apples. Yeah. And every apple's got a whole bunch of apple seeds. Yeah. And if you take them and you plant them, before long you've got an orchard. And if you keep going, half of the North Island's filled with apple trees. Yeah. You just come from one seed. And Jesus takes this concept when he's teaching the people about the kingdom of God. He says over and over again through the Gospels and, you know, one particular passage in Mark 4, he, he, he talks about, he, he gives all these illustrations that the kingdom of God is like you take a seed and you plant it and you don't know how it grows and you go to sleep and it comes up and, and all this stuff's going on just from the seed. And, he, and he's saying to the, he says to the disciples, to you has been given the ability to understand the mystery of the kingdom. In other words, if you don't understand this whole principle of the power of a seed and sowing and reaping and, and all of that, you won't understand the kingdom because the kingdom is about increase. And it starts with a seed. And then, of course, Jesus talks about himself. And he says, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces great fruit. And he's talking about him laying down his life as a seed. Yes. Yeah. And you look at what's happened since then. Yeah. You know, millions, billions of people have come into the kingdom. Yeah. Their lives have been radically changed. Yeah. Society, well, you, you know, the, the, the incredible freedoms and blessing of most of the Western world came out of the church. Uh, medicine and education and, and so many things, the mindsets of justice and, and, and governance and law and so much stuff yeah. 
come out of the kingdom. And then, he, and then when you follow on through the gospel and, and the message of, of, the, of the church is that you and I have the potential also to become a seed as we invest our lives into the kingdom. And who knows what incredible fruit is coming out of your life and your life and your life and all of our lives together. What's it going to look like in a few generations in this region? I mean, we are involved in the most amazing thing on the planet. And I sometimes think that Daryl and I, in fact, often talk about it when we're driving or doing whatever we're doing, that we've lived such a privileged life. Because what else would you want to invest your life in other than the purposes of God? Because it's such an amazing thing. And so God is always about increase. And, and, and you know, for in your individual life, God wants to bring about tremendous increase in every area of your life. In your relationships, in your health, in your finances, in your, your future, your career, your business, whatever it is. Yeah, because he's a God of increase. See? And so, so when you commit your life to him, favor comes on you. You know, I, I often think of Joseph, you know, he gets this coat and it's, a, it's a, a symbol of his father's love and favor of his provision and his protection. And he's got this coat that's pretty outlandish, actually. It's multicolored, so he can't hide. It's, it's hanging out everywhere. Everybody can see him. He walks down the street like, look at that kid. And, and, and they're probably jealous because his dad's pretty wealthy. And so it's a symbol of his status, if you like, in life and, and the favor of his dad upon him. And not everybody likes it. How many know some people don't like that? But you know what? God wants you to wear his favor with great, you know, let it hang out. Amen. Lumber don't like it, you know. I'm a child of God. His blessings on my life. Look at my family. Look at my, at my health. Look at what God's doing. Come on, somebody. And uh, I sometimes say God's a show off, you know. He, he just wants people to see his love. He wants people to see his glory. He wants them to see his mercy and his favor and his forgiveness and his cleansing and all of those wonderful things. I like it. It was at Simon that was leading us this morning, and he's talking about lightning coming out of your fingertips. I go, point to somebody and see what happens this morning. No, no don't do that. Actually, I know a guy, a South African uh, guy that got saved in his teenage years, and he, he just had a radical uh, gift on his life for evangelism. And he was pretty wild and undisciplined and didn't understand much about the anointing in the early days. And he would literally point to people and go, bang, and they'd go down under the power of God. You know, he's going, uh, boom, boom, boom. You know, it's kind of like... I, so, you know, you kind of look at that and you go, what was God doing? I think God was going, that's not meant to be like that. You know, it's kind of like, you know, anyway. <laughs> In John, 1 John 4 verse 8, it states that God is love. God is love. It's not saying that God does loving things or that he has an expression of love towards us or he's a loving person. It's not saying that. It's, it's saying that God is the essence of love. It's saying that love is an integral part of who God is. It's not something he does. It's not a character trait. It's part of his nature, of his makeup. And when you start to think about that, it's indicating to us that it's impossible for God to do anything that would violate his inherent nature of love. So everything God says, everything God does, everything he's involved in is an expression of his love. And, and when we focus on him and we begin to seek him and walk with him and, and love him, his desire is that our life would be encapsulated in his love. And part of his love is the expression of his power in and through his life, our life, his presence. His anointing, His grace, His favor upon us. All of an expression of His love. And, and you know, one of the things about God is that He's a miracle worker. He's a way maker. I love that song. I don't know how many of you know that song, Waymaker. 
If you don't know it, you need to get on YouTube. And what's the name of the African worship leader that wrote that? I forget what her, she goes by the name of Sancho or some, some sort of name like that. Uh, it's just a great song because it reminds me that when you can't see him, you can't feel him, you can't hear him, he's still working. He is going to make a way. And it's an expression of his love. And so he heals and he delivers us. He, he sets people free. He provides and he protects. He, and so much more. And it's all an expression of who he is. It's not something he does because he feels obligated. It's something that flows out of his heart. And there's a river of the love of God that is constantly flowing toward you. And he wants to flow in you and through you. Come on, somebody. And um, Jesus came and revealed the Father's heart to lost humanity. Came to expose the nature of God and what he was really like. And on more than one occasion, he said to the people, even if you don't believe what I say, you have to believe on the basis of the miracles. And... um, And the miracles revealed the Father's heart of love for broken people, revealed his nature, revealed his desire to intervene in the circumstances of people's lives. So Jesus goes around and he he casts out devils and he heals the sick and he, he, he adjusts their thinking. It says in a few places in the Gospels, things like this, that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees and religious teachers. They were dull and boring. They didn't impart life. They shut you down, restricted you, locked you in. And here comes this guy that says, this God that's so distant to you, he wants to come and scratch you where you itch. He wants to just kind of come right into your life. He's interested in every aspect. He loves you. And it's kind of like such a shift of a mindset, such a change. And how many know the church still struggles with some of that? Not here, I know, but some places you go, you meet people that still kind of working that through. And and the reality is the gospel is good news for everyone. God doesn't just love you. He is love. And he desires that intimate relationship with you to walk with you and be involved in every aspect of your life and care for you in such an amazing way. And so towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, He was very specific in instructing his followers uh, about what they needed to do and how to continue his ministry on earth. And with the same ability to work miracles and and release the love of God and the the power of God to intervene in people's lives. And uh, you see, miracles is an integral part of the good news. And, uh, And so Jesus went about doing and teaching. And he wants us to go about doing and teaching. So not just teaching. Uh, I, I don't know, it's probably not a very common term these days, but you go back a few years, we used to talk about the church being a full gospel church. Hey, how many can remember those days? Don't show your age. <laughs> full gospel. We're a full gospel church. What does that mean? It means we don't just make a declaration, we bring a demonstration. And it's interesting, you know, Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the earth before the end comes. He did not say the gospel of salvation. He said the gospel of the kingdom. And there is a difference. Because when you start talking about the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus said things like this. When I cast out demons by the finger of God, you'll know the kingdom of God has come. When I heal the sick, you'll know the kingdom has come. The gospel of salvation may tell you that Jesus died to save you, but that's not the gospel of the kingdom. Because the gospel of the kingdom demands a a, a demonstration of the declaration. That we say Jesus died 
rose again, overcame every principality and power. According to the Scriptures, He carried away your sin. He carried away your sickness. He carried away your disease. He carried away your infirmities, your weaknesses. He carried away your poverty. He carried away every bondage and restriction and limitation and influence that darkness brought through the fall. He broke it all. He carried it all away. And the church needs to come with the power of God to demonstrate the fact that he is above all and beyond all has broken the hold of everything and sets people free and heals the sick and delivers the bound and uh, come on somebody it's called the full gospel and so he says to his followers at the end of his life he says all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me Now go in my name. And in the Hebrew mindset, the name and the person are inseparable. So when he says, go in my name, he's saying you can go with my full authority. And when you use my name, it's as if I'm there because I'm there. I'm backing up my name. So he gives to his followers the authority based on the fact that he has all authority. So he's given to us all authority in his name for the purposes of his kingdom. And then a little bit later, he says to them, I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. So he says, When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. So now you've got the authority and now you've got the supernatural enabling. Now you've got the power to back up the authority and to enforce the kingdom. How many know when he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, go and subdue and govern? He says to the church, it's the mandate on the church to subdue and govern, to extend the kingdom, to bring people under the government of God as they uh, are processed and brought into an encounter, a power encounter with Jesus Christ. People are not meant to be Christianized. They're meant to be born again by a power encounter with the Spirit of the living God. So that's why he could say in John 14, those that believe in my name, the works that I do, they will do also. (laughs) Those that believe in my name, the works that I do, they will do also. Why? Because I've given you authority and I've given you power. And, and, And the church, the mandate on the church is to carry on Jesus' ministry as usual, as it was. Come on, somebody, as it was. And, uh, and so this morning, I want to speak to you about miracles. I want to talk to you about miracles. Uh, there's a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 10, and verses 6 and 7, that are very profound and have been just one of my favorite passages, I guess. And it's taken from the life of Saul. And Saul's dad had lost his donkeys. His donkeys had wandered off somewhere. And so he says to Saul, I want you to go find my donkeys. And so Saul goes off wandering around the countryside looking for these donkeys. And in the process of it, he comes, he encounters Samuel the prophet. And Samuel says to him, Saul, your dad's found the donkeys and now he's not worried about the donkeys anymore. He's worried about you. Where are you? You better go home. And then he starts to prophesy over me. He said, when you go home, on the way, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And one of the things he says to him, he says, as you go along the road, you're going to meet a bunch of prophets that are coming down from the high place where they've been worshiping and sacrificing and so on. And they're going to come down and they're going to be prophesying. And he says this to them in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 10, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them. And you will be turned into another man. And let it be that when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, because God is with you. You know what? When the Spirit of God comes upon you, 
It's God's intention that you be changed into another man. Yeah. It's all right, ladies. It, it, he'll change you into another woman. It's all right. So just relax. It's not gender transition teaching. <laughs> changed into a different kind of person. Jesus says to them, stay in Jerusalem until you receive power. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not intended to be a religious ritual. It's not intended to be somebody learning how to speak in tongues. It's meant to be a power encounter. When you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit. You are born of the Spirit. But there is a second experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit which is not receiving the Holy Spirit. It's talking about being coming fully immersed, saturated in and filled to overflowing with the presence of God that transforms every part of your life so that you are never the same again. It activates the dormant gifts and callings that are within you. Saul begins to prophesy. Some of the people said, is he now one of the prophets? Because the power of God had touched his life in such a way that he would never be the same again. Come on, somebody. And if you haven't had that kind of power encounter, then you need it, my friend. It's God's intention for you to not just, you know, enjoy some anointing, some touch of God and and jump around and get happy. It's more than that. It's meant to transform your life. It's a power encounter with the fire of God. Jesus said, uh, uh, John the Baptist said he will baptize you with a, as a spirit and with fire. There's meant to come the fire of God so that you and I begin to carry something that's intense, it's passionate, it's powerful, it changes atmospheres, it impacts people's lives and it extends the kingdom of God. Oh, <laughs> oh. Man, I had five hours rolling around the floor in a motel in Hamilton in 1970 on my own. I brought up in a church that didn't, in a denomination that did not believe in miracles for today, did not believe in the power of God. They're called cessationists. In other words, it means that when the last of the apostles died, all the miracles and everything stopped. They ceased then. So now we've got the book and that's it. You got the Bible, that's it. And I grew up thinking, that's not enough. Yeah. I love the Word of God, but I kept reading the Word of God, and it's talking to me about power. Right. It's talking about miracles, it's talking about healings, yeah. talking about deliverance, and I'm thinking, I need that. Yeah. It's miserable to do the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, let me yeah. tell you, that's a rotten way to live. And let me tell you, it's not intended for anybody to live like that. On the day of Pentecost, when the people said to Peter, what do we do? He said, repent. That means receive Jesus. Be baptized in water and receive the Holy Spirit. It is a three-part process. Just as the temple had three courts and you were made of spirit, soul, and body, there is a threefold experience of the power of God in our lives to totally transform us so that we are able to walk as Jesus intended us to walk in the full authority that he's given and in the full power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And then he says this, that once that's happened, you can do whatever the occasion demands because God is with you. That's crazy. It means you can walk into the room and go, I'm here. What do you need? (laughs) Come on. Come on. It means that lightning out of the fingers kind of stuff. The power of God. He says, because you can do whatever you need to do, whatever the occasion demands. You can step into the middle of whatever arena and bring the power and presence of God to bear in that situation. Because God is with you. So, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, a few days before, he's been denying that he even knows Jesus in front of a servant girl. And now the power of God has come on him. 
And he stands up and he does what the occasion demands. And he begins to explain to the crowd what's happening with these people that some think are drunk. And 3,000 people get saved. Peter and John are walking into the temple and there's a crippled man. And they do what the occasion demands. And the crippled man gets healed and starts leaping and shouting around the temple. Philip goes down to Samaria and he does what the occasion demands. It says that he preached Jesus and he did many miracles and he cast out many demons. There was joy in the whole city. Come on, because they were touched by the power of God and they went about doing what was necessary, what was needed, what the occasion demanded and it changed whole spectrums of society. Woo! It's called being the church. (laughs) Mark 16. And these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Who will cast? The believers. Oh, not the pastors, the elders, the prophets, the apostles. No, no, the believers. They will take up serpents and they'll drink anything deadly. It won't hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. How many know that's all about a supernatural life? It's just like everything's different. It's like Paul putting sticks on the fire and a a death adder grabs him by the hand. A serpent grabs him. They know it's a poisonous serpent because the locals say he must have been a murderer and he escaped the sea, but justice won't allow him to escape. So now he's going to die by this snake bite. And they expected him to blow up, it says. The Bible says they expect him to blow up. No, not like that, like swell up and drop dead. And then he's just shook it off into the fire and nothing happens. I like that. I don't think it means you're meant to go looking for snakes to handle and prove that you're a Christian. I don't quite, I don't go to churches like that. But I do, I do think it means that you can be in situations where crazy stuff's going on. It's not going to hurt you. <laughs> And they'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't say they lay hands on the sick and, and maybe, maybe some will. But it's the believers. The signs follow believers. The signs of what you believe follow you right now. But see, the signs that he wants us to have following us are the signs of people whose lives have been transformed by the power of God. And one of the challenges we have, we've got churches full of unbelieving believers. We we believe certain things, but we don't believe other things. And not here, of course, but some places you go, you know, you can see that. (laughs) And all around us, there are people with needs. It's a broken society. And God puts us in the middle of brokenness and he says, go and heal it. Go and beautify it. Go and build my kingdom. Go and extend. I've given you my authority. I've given you my power. Now go and use it to extend my kingdom. Go and and use it to heal society. Go and use it to set people free. And... um, we began a real journey with this whole thing of miracles at the end of 1984 when we were pastoring up here in Howick. And since I could spend hours telling you about the great things that we've seen God do. And in fact, Simon mentioned this morning about limbs growing back. One of the first outstanding miracles we ever saw up in Howick was a four-year-old girl that had been born without a foot or ankle on one leg and it grew in two days. That's pretty outrageous, isn't it? Really upset the medical people. Freaked out her unsaved father who walked down the, the, the aisle of the church the next Sunday morning in the middle of worship, carrying his daughter, bawling his eyes out and shouting out, I've seen a real miracle of God. Daryl in Vietnam, one of the trips that she was doing in there was 
ministering to people and there was a woman that had had her face smashed up in a car accident and you know a lot of those countries you don't get access to medical things and her face was all disformed because of the accident and as Daria laid her hands on her face the bones readjusted and came back into alignment and she ended up looking like she was meant to look that's pretty cool a lump on the woman's abdomen of that same period of time just disappearing under her hands just a, a few weeks ago there was an old gentleman in the church that we're based in and and uh, I didn't know but I'm ministering to him because he had his shoulders what I found out later he'd fallen off the roof of his house two years earlier smashed his shoulders smashed his leg up so he couldn't lift either arm beyond about that he could bend his elbows he couldn't he couldn't carry anything with any weight at all. And, and, and so I just ministered to him a couple of times. It didn't seem like anything much was happening. But the Monday night, he rang one of the leaders in the church, and he's totally healed. So God heals instantaneously, but he also heals supernaturally. But here's the deal. When I lay hands on somebody, something always shifts. It always shifts. The Bible says... That when you lay hands on somebody, there is an impartation of spirit power. And if you have faith to believe it, something's going to happen. It's not empty hands on empty heads. There's a hand full of the fire and power of God that when I stand in faith and exercise it and lay it on somebody that's sick, something is going to move with that condition. And it's no different for you. It's no different for you. Jesus said, If you believe in me, the works that I do, you will also do. If if you're a believer, you will cast out devils in my name. You will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Turn to somebody and say, you are called to be a miracle worker. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Something shifts. I remember uh, one of the craziest things I've seen. I remember when we were past and we'd get this prayer request. We used to do prayer requests at each service and you'd get people that had needs or whatever. And, and normally they're not in the service. You know, it's a friend of a, somebody or a family member or something. And, and I get this prayer request this night and it just says this young woman with the, who's hurt her back, you know. And so I just went to pray for that. And as I went to pray for it, I just had this impression she's in the meeting. So I said, hang on a minute, are you in the meeting? And so there's this girl right down the back, young 20-year-old, 20-something, puts up a hand, see. She's a visitor, and I ask her, would she mind coming down? I'd like to minister to her. So she and her boyfriend walked down, and they were really uncomfortable. They weren't church-going people, and, you know, obviously that was pretty foreign to them, standing in front of a bunch of people, and... And I didn't recognize at the time, it didn't didn't register with me, but I thought about it later, that when she walked down toward me, she walked kind of a little bit sideways. And uh, so anyway, you know, they were obviously very self-conscious and awkward, and and I just spoke to her back and said to her, move around, tell me what you couldn't do, you know, what would cause you pain, just check it out. And she was not very communicative at all. She was kind of freaked out, I think. And, and so I, I just said to her, look, well, I'll just, you know, bend over, touch your, knee, your toes, you know, do something like that, you know. So she bent down to about her knees. She went down like this, and then she stood up with a puzzled look on her face. And I said, no, 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 go down and touch your ankles, you know, go down and touch your toes. And so she goes down, she gets to her ankles, and she screamed. And she starts to bawl like a baby. Like she's screaming, she's totally lost it. You know, she's just sobbing. And I'm thinking, I've killed her. I'm thinking, <laughs> do I call the paramedics? What's happening? You know, and I'm trying to go, are you okay? What's going on? And she's kind of going, yeah, you, and blubbering and going on. And so anyway, I, well, you know, go back to your seat and whatever, continue on with the meeting. And I'm thinking, I'll catch her after, but she's gone, you know. And then I meet the people that bought her. And they tell me that she was in a major uh, motor accident a few months earlier. She'd been airlifted to the Alfred Hospital in um, uh, Melbourne and her back was uh, broken in a number of places. Now they put a steel rod right down the back so she can't bend. Oh, wow. 
So the next Sunday, she's back in church. I got to talk with her, and it's true. She could move without any restriction whatsoever in any direction. Now, they lived in another town, and we lost track with them. So don't tell me what God can't do. Let me tell you what I've seen him do. I want to talk to you this morning about building a culture of miracles. Because it's not just miracles of healing. It's, you know, miracles of provision. You look through scripture, you see all these crazy stories of Elijah with a widow woman who's about to die, eat their last meal and die. And they live on it for, you know, we don't know how long. We know the famine went for three and a half years. You see the woman with Elisha and her two boys are about to be taken into slavery and all she's got a little bit of oil. And it just supernaturally multiplies. He pays off all the debt. You you see the feeding of 5,000. How many know that's crazy? Probably more like 20,000 actually. 5,000 men plus women and children. Off a little boy's lunch. That's pretty cool. Uh, You see all sorts of things of deliverance, of of amazing things happening. You see Daniel in the lion's den. You see Paul. You know, the experiences of Paul are are absolutely bizarre if you actually take the time to read what he went through. He went through some terrible stuff. But, you know, he floated in the ocean for three days and three nights on one occasion. Now, I don't think that's particularly desirable, but it's amazing what God brought him through. And, and, you know, there's just so many things and so many pictures in Scripture about so many interventions of God in people's lives and circumstances and, and all of that kind of thing. And so this morning I want to talk to you about building a culture of miracles. How do I build a culture of miracles around my life, around my family? How do we build a culture of miracles in this house? I believe God wants to bring significant increase to the river. I have carried that for the last couple couple of years or so, it bugs me. It just kind of eats away at me every time I'm talking to you and thinking about it. I just feel like God wants to break out in this place in a much greater measure. And I'm not talking about in the sweet by and by. I'm talking about in this season at this time. And I feel like God wants to to really get a hold of our attention this morning and and, and lift us into a place where we have a, a greater culture of miracles in our individual lives and in our lives together uh, as a corporate body. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about is perspective. Perspective is about having an expectation for miracles. It's about your foundational belief. It's about your convictions. You know, Jesus said, there's a man that's got this demon-possessed boy's and the disciples have tried to cast him out in the cart. Jesus comes down from the mountain and, and, and the man's saying, oh yeah, I believe, help my unbelief. I don't know what's going on, you know. And Jesus says, he says this, if you can believe, all things are possible. If you can believe. And sometimes you've got to do a bit of work on yourself. So my challenge to you this morning is what really is your personal conviction and perspective about God working miracles in and through your life and in this house? Because if you can believe, all things are possible. Come on, somebody, it's getting quiet in here. This is what you were created for. I love this because this is where the life flows. This is where there is a power encounter between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And God always wins. He always wins. So this is our opportunity to step into the zone and to break the hold and release the kingdom of God in power. You know, God didn't tell you to pray for the sick. He told you to heal the sick. You do your praying at home. Do your intercession at home. Do you, because the second point I want to talk about is preparation. You, it's not about you trying to make something happen. It's about you releasing the anointing that you carry and that makes something happen. And Jesus didn't say to the disciples, go and pray for the sick. He said, go and heal the sick. Go and cast out the devils. Because you carry healing anointing. You carry miracle power. 
You don't have to try and call God down, try and drag him up. You don't have to try and make people get healed. And if you need healing, you don't have to try and do something to get healed. You just have to receive. See? And so my responsibility, if people don't get healed, it's not their problem, it's my problem. I'm a blockage to the flow. How many know, come on somebody. And so often people are trying to get healed. I say, don't pray. Don't try and get healed. Just relax and receive. See, but I got to do preparation. Preparation is about taking steps to align yourself with the purposes of God. So it's about preparing myself mentally, emotionally to be a miracle worker. Preparing my heart to be a channel for release of his power. I know when I began to, you know, we began these miracle service in 1984. And, and we very quickly had all sorts of, we were advertising them, you know, across the town. And, uh, and so you got people coming in with all sorts of shocking conditions. And, and, you know, I'm excited about this until I realize I'm the preacher and I've never done it before. You know, it's all that kind of thing. And so now we've got people coming in that are really badly crippled up and all sorts of things going on. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, I just don't have faith for that. And I began to really cry out to the Lord. I needed to prepare my heart more. And, and, and emotionally, you know, it's, it's, how many know sometimes it stretches you emotionally, your courage, you know, you, you, you're confronted with this need and, and, and they're looking to you to bring an answer and we're meant to bring the answer. Come on, somebody. Yeah. It's my responsibility. Yeah. He's given me authority, given me power. So now I've got to step into it. So I have to prepare myself. And I start praying and I start seeking God and going to God, I just don't have faith for these people. And the Lord said to me, you don't have to have faith for the people. You don't have to have faith for the condition. And he took me to that verse in John 14, 12. If you believe in me. The works that I do, you will. Oh, man, that shifted everything for me. I thought, Jesus, you've done it all. You've raised the dead. You've opened blind. You've done it all. I can believe in you. (laughs) I don't have to kind of look at the condition and whatever. I mean, there is an element of that because it's looking you right in the face. How many know that's the way storms and mountains are? They look you right in the face. They want to talk to you. But you're meant to talk to them, not let them talk to you. See? So now I've got to just... You know, distance myself almost. That's why I don't want to talk to people. When, when, when we're doing stuff like that, I, I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to, people telling me what's wrong. I don't want this. I just want to hear from God. I want the Holy Ghost. Because that's all they, I've got to give them. And that's what, the only thing that's going to solve it. It's not a discussion. It's a power encounter. Something's got to break the hold of that thing. See? So I have to prepare myself. It's about taking steps of, of meditation and, and steps of faith. You know, uh, <clears throat> miracles occur when preparation and destiny collide. That was in a destiny moment. How do we know that's a destiny moment right there? And, uh, and miracles occur when preparation and promises meet. It's when you've prepared your heart and you, you step into the promise. See? That I'm going to lay hands on the sick and something's going to happen. Yeah. It always happens. Something always happens. Yeah. A, a, a young preacher came to Spurgeon one time and said to him, Dr. Spurgeon, how come every time you preach, somebody gets saved? People get saved. And Spurgeon said to the young preacher, huh, surely you don't believe people get saved every time you preach. And he went, no, well, I don't. He said, well, that's the difference. I do. <laughs> it's the same with See, working miracles, it's a gift of working miracles. You've got to work miracles. Miracles don't happen. They don't drop out of the sky. You make them happen. You do miracles like Jesus did miracles, like Philip going down to Samaria, and he did miracles. But it came out of a preparation. Getting myself in the zone so that I can believe God, I can carry what he wants me to carry and do what he called me to do. The third one is perseverance. And perseverance is about continuing in faith and expectation. It's about understanding when there's nothing happening that I can see he's still working. Then people say, well, what about the people who didn't get healed? That's not my deal. 
It's my responsibility to minister healing. I may not see the outcome of it. Help me know sometimes it's progressive. Sometimes it's supernatural and it's, a, it's a, an accelerated process, but it can be time. Yes. But if I'm a pro, see, it's a difference between faith and hope. You can't minister out of hope. I'm going to minister to you, hope something happens. How many know hope doesn't release anything? Hope is of the future. I hope. It may be a confident hope, but faith takes hold of what we hope for and brings it into the present and releases it. So I have to minister in faith. And faith can only come from revelation and conviction that comes from the revelation. I can't pump it up. It's not mental gymnastics. I've got to have the promise of God, the fire of God burning inside of me as a conviction that when I lay hands on the sick, something is going to happen. (sighs) Remember this. A miracle always horrible before it happens. If it wasn't horrible, you didn't need a miracle. Our brother needs a miracle because it's horrible. So that's just the place God wants to be. <laughs> and look at all the things around, you know, Jesus, you know, there's so many horrible things and he just goes boom in the middle of it and goes, I love that. He's given you the authority to do that. He's called you for that, to be a carrier of his glory, of his power, of his presence. So, Perseverance is about continuing to put yourself in a position to receive a miracle. Keep ministering to the sick. You know what? I never saw anybody healed under my ministry until I started ministering to the sick. It's profound, isn't it? (laughs) And sometimes there's a battle. How many know the devil does not want you to be a miracle worker? So he's going to hammer you with every reason why you shouldn't be one, why you shouldn't do it, why it's not going to work. Because everybody can tell you the story about, I got prayed for and nothing happened. You know why it didn't happen? Because when you walked away, you said nothing happened. The power of death and life is in your tongue. I've seen so many many people kill their, uh, their miracle by the words of their mouth. I didn't feel anything, so nothing shifted. Well, you said it. I've still got it. You said it. What you should be saying is, I believe something shifted. Something started. God is working in me. God is working around my life. Come on, somebody. God's working in my finance. God's working in my relationships. God's working in my career. God's working in my business. (laughs) <laughs> and then fourthly, position. Position's about putting yourself in a position so that if God doesn't come through, you're not going to make it. You might look a bit of an idiot. Do you know what happened? If you read the account of Peter and John at the temple, are we doing all right? Time's gone, I guess. I don't know. Are you okay? Everybody okay? I'm okay and I got the mic, so that's it. But you know, Peter and John, they see this crippled guy and they say, we haven't got what you're looking for, but what we have, we, we're going to give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and be healed. He doesn't move. Read the account. They take him by the hands and lift him up. And as they lift him up, his ankles are healed. How many know when you do that, you're really out on a limb right there? I'm lifting him up. Nothing happens. I'm an idiot. But no, I believe as I lift him up, something's going to happen. Such as I have, I give you. I'm not praying. I'm not interceding. I'm imparting because I'm carrying something. It's not me, but I'm a carrier of it. I'm a vessel. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be seen to be of God and not of man. (laughs) It's wonderful, isn't it? It's understanding that God is a show-off, as I said before. He wants people to be impacted by his love and power and mercy. And and position is about miracles in the marketplace. You know, the the church and Jesus, you know, most of the miracles in Scripture are on the beach, in the marketplace, out on the farm somewhere, in the mountains, whatever. You have to give God a chance. Just give him a chance. 
I got on a plane a while ago flying from Melbourne to Adelaide and found myself sitting next to a young Indian lady, probably in her late 20s. And um, I pulled out my book to read. I was reading a book. It was an apologetics. Uh, it's it something about is Jesus real? I forget the title of it. But I pulled it out. And this girl pulls out a book, the same book. She pulls it out. And I look at her and I go, well, are you a Christian? And she goes, no. <laughs> I mean, no, that's a setup. And, uh, and, and so I said to her, so what are you reading the books? She said, well, my brother and I were brought up Hindus. My parents weren't really practicing Hindus. And so now we don't really know what we believe. So we decided that for six months, we're going to read books on the different main religions and decide what's right. And I said, I commend you. That's phenomenal. I believe if people are sincere in their pursuit of truth, God will reveal himself. So, I said to her, would it be that if you you read a book on Buddhism, by the time you got to the end of the book, you'd think that was the right thing? And then if you read another book on Islam, by the time you got to the end of it, you'd probably think that was the right thing. And she said, Yes. I said, so at the end of your six months of reading, you're going to be more confused than you were at the beginning. And she kind of went, well, maybe. You know. I said, so how, she was about halfway through the book, so I had a pretty good idea of what she'd read. So I said to her, just imagine with me for a moment that if Jesus is who he said he really is, that he knows everything, he's everywhere, he's the son of God. So that means he's hearing our conversation. If, just imagine that, that that's what he's like. He knows everything. So if he knows everything and he knows the conversation, he knows the journey you're on, then if he's God, he should really be able to reveal himself to you right here and right now. And she kind of went, oh, I can see she's getting a bit freaked out. He's kind of like, yeah, I suppose so. I said, so how would it be if I just, would you mind if I just took your hand for a moment and prayed briefly? I'm a Christian and I believe Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. So she kind of goes, okay. I took a hand and I just said, Jesus, would you make yourself known to her? Amen. So she sits back in the, in the seat. She was sitting forward and she kind of sat back and she sighed and the tears started to run down her face. And so she sat there for, I don't know, maybe two or three minutes, whatever it was. And then she sat forward and sort of opened her eyes and like looked a bit, you know, looked a bit stunned or whatever. And uh, I said to her, so what's happening? And she said, I don't know. I just feel warm and I feel so peaceful. I just feel like so peaceful. She just kept saying, I just feel so peaceful. And I said, well, you know, Jesus' name is the Prince of Peace. And now he's revealed himself to you. He's come close to you. And, uh, you know, it's not much point reading books. You just need to get to know him a bit more. So you can do that. Every one of you can do that. It's not because I'm any different from you. I, I get freaked out by doing that. Just as my, In fact, I missed a really good opportunity the other day, and I've been kicking myself ever since. A guy we know had an operation on his shoulder. His wife is in our home right now looking after our dog. And while I was talking to him, I'm feeling like I should pray for him. And I thought, oh, no, I won't pray for him. I shouldn't minister. No, I won't minister. I know none of you are ever like that. I'm just letting you know I feel what you feel. You could sit with somebody and just say, Jesus, make yourself real. And while I'm saying that in English, I'm going, Shakatarabusumando. I release the power of God. I'm saying that on the, how many know you can pray on two different levels? <laughs> on the inside of me, I'm saying, get a Jesus God. <laughs> I release the presence of God. I release the power. 